this piece, uh, this piece of writing is contained in the Collected Works of C.G. Young, volume 18, pages 582 to 588, paragraphs 1343 to 1356. Now I'm just going to do a sound check. Okay, seems to be okay. Um, all right. So, this is Carl Jung, Return to the Simple Life. What are your views on a return of the Swiss people to the simple life? This was a question that was put to him. And keep in mind that Dr. Jung lived at a time uh, that had two world wars raging around his country. And so there was quite a bit of privation during that period for Swiss people. He ended up growing his own potatoes. <clears throat> and when he built his house in Bollingen, not the one that his family lived in, but the one that he went to frequently for meditation purposes, um, he did not have it plumbed nor electrified. And he did that intentionally so that he could gain access to his deep unconscious. And so, anyway, I'm going to restart what I was reading here. Return to the simple life. What are your views on a return of the Swiss people to the simple life? The return to the simple life can be regarded as an unhoped for piece of good fortune even though it demands considerable self-sacrifice and is not undertaken voluntarily. Before I go too much farther, let me put my picture back on the screen, but I will put it in the upper left corner of the video, just uh, there. Okay. Thanks to the mass media and the cheap sensationalism offered by the cinema, radio, and newspapers, and thousands of amusements of all kinds, life in the recent past has rapidly been approaching a condition that was not far removed, that was not far, that was not far removed from the hectic American tempo. Indeed, up in the matter of divorces, Zurich has already reached the American record. All time-saving all time-saving devices, among which we must count easier means of communication and other conveniences, do not, paradoxically enough, save time, but merely cram our time so full that we have no time for anything. Hence the breathless haste superficially uh, hence the breathless haste, superficiality, and nervous exhaustion with all the concomitant with all the concomitant symptoms, craving for stimulation, impatience, craving for stimul craving for stimulation, impatience, irritability, vacillation, etc. Such a state may lead to all sorts of other things, but never to any increased culture of the mind and heart. Do you think we should turn more and more to the treasures of our culture? As the booming book trade in many countries shows, if the worst comes to the worst, if the worst comes to the worst, people will even turn to a good book. Unfortunately, such a decision always needs a compelling external cause. Unless driven by necessity, most people would never dream of turning to the treasures of our culture. The delusion of steady social improvement has been dinned into them so long that they want to forget the past as quickly as possible so as not to miss the brave new world that is constantly being dangled before their eyes by unreformable world reformers. 
their neuroth their neurasthenic craving for the latest novelty is a sickness and not culture. The essence of culture is continuity and conservation of the past. Craving for novelty produces only anti-culture and ends in barbarism. The, the inevitable outcome is that eventually the whole nation will yearn for the very culture which, owing to the delusion of better conditions in the future, which seldom, if ever, materialize, has almost or entirely disappeared. Unfortunately, our world, or perhaps the moral structure of man, is so constituted that no progress and no improvement are consistently good, since sooner or later the corresponding misuse will appear which turns the blessing into a curse. Can anyone seriously maintain that our wars are in any way better than those of the Romans? The craze of the craze for mass organization wrenches everyone out of his private world into the deafening tumult of the marketplace, making him an unconscious, meaningless particle in the mass, making him a making him an unconscious, meaningless particle in the mass and the helpless prey of every kind of suggestion. The never-failing bait is the alleged better future, which prevents him from adapting himself to the actual present and making the best of it. He no longer lives in the present at he no longer lives in the present and for the future, but in a totally unrealistic way, already in the future, defrauded of the present and even more of the past, cut off from his roots, robbed of his continuity, and everlastingly duped by the mocking Fata Morgana of a better future. A tremendous, dis a tremendous disillusionment is needed to save people from wishful thinking and bring them back to the sound bases of tradition and to remind them of the blessings of a spiritual culture which the age of progress has destroyed with its nihilistic criticism. One has only to think of the spiritual devastation that has already been wrought by materialism, the invention of would-be intellectuals equipped with truly infantile arguments. <clears throat> Turning the page. Welcome, everyone. Hello, Michael. And the question is, incredible, hey, will you be, uh, I'll need more than that in order to answer your question. uploading this talk. I'm at work, but would love to re-listen to this one. Uh, yes, it will be available for replay. This is a behind-the-scenes reading, so it contains all my flubs and retakes, and at some point in the future I may get time to edit it, but so it will be in the playlist called Behind the Scenes, uh, but I'm not going to emphasize it. It will be on the home page of the channel until it's pushed off with four other videos, four more recent videos. Anyway, <clears throat> and so, anyway, um, okay, I'm on page three of seven. It will be difficult to get rid of the kind of thinking whose very stupidity makes it so popular. Do you believe that happiness is found not in material, but in spiritual things? Apparently, these are questions that someone was putting to Dr. Jung, and I haven't delineated them all out. But, okay, so the question is, all right, so the question is, do you believe that happiness is found not in material, but in spiritual things? To remove the ideal from the material to the spiritual 
to the spiritual world is a tricky business because material happiness is something tangible if ever it is attained and the spirit an invisible thing which it is difficult to find or to demonstrate. It is even supposed that most of what goes by the name of spirit is so much empty talk and a clattering of words. An attainable sausage <laughs> an attainable sausage is, as a rule, more illuminating than a devotional exercise. In other words, to find happiness in the spirit, one must be possessed of a spirit to find happiness in. A life of ease and security has convinced everyone of all the material joys and has even compelled the spirit to devise new and better ways to material welfare, but it has never produced spirit. Probably only suffering, disillusion, and self-denial do that. Anyone who can live under such stresses and still find life worthwhile already has spirit or at least has some inkling of it. But at all times, there are only very few who are convinced from the bottom of their hearts that material happiness is a danger to the spirit and who are able to, and who are able to renounce the world for the, and who are able to renounce the world for its sake. I hope therefore that the scourge which is now lashing Europe will bring the nations to realize that this world, which was never the best of all possible worlds in the past, will, will not be so in the future either. It is, as always, compounded of day and night, light and darkness, brief joys and abiding sorrows, a battleground without respite or peace, because it is nothing but the melting pot of human desires. But the spirit is another world within this world. If it is not just a refuge for cowards, it comes only to those who suffer life in this world and accept even happiness with a gesture of polite doubt. Had the Christian teachings not been so utterly forgotten in the face of all this technological progress, the, the avalanches that now threaten to engulf Europe would never have started rolling. Belief in this world leaves room neither for the spirit of Christianity nor for any other good spirit. The spirit is always hidden and safe in the world, an inviolable sanctuary for those who have forsworn, if not the world, at least their belief in it. Now, I do want to take a look just for a moment here at the um, at the original of this um, essay because I want to know what, okay, it's paragraph, um, let's see, let's see if I can get to it pretty quickly before I start the next question. Okay, so... Okay, so this is a response that um, that Jung. This was a response that Dr. Jung gave to a questionnaire, which was sent to him asking on the effects of war, wartime conditions in Switzerland in May 1941. So this was nearly two years after the beginning of World War, uh, I'm sorry, nearly two years after the beginning of World War II in Europe, but before the United States had entered the war. And Marcus Pedridis. At the end, happiness is in your mind. Absolutely. Okay, so here's the next question from this question here. Just a moment. All right, so the next question. Can there be an optimism of austerity? Instead of optimism, 
I would have said an optimum of a, I would have said an optimum of austerity. But if optimism is really meant, very much more would be required for austerity is anything but enjoyable. It means real suffering, especially if it assumes acute form. You can be optimistic in the face of martyrdom only if you are sure of the bliss to come. But a certain minimal degree of austerity I regard as beneficial. At any rate, it is healthier than affluence, which only a very few people can enjoy without ill effects, whether physical or psychic. Of course, one does not wish anything unpleasant for anybody, least of all oneself. But in comparison with other countries, Switzerland has so much affluence to spare, however honorably earned, that we are in an excellent position to give some of it away. There is an optimism of austerity which it is dangerous to exceed, for too much of it does not make you good, but hard and bitter. As the Swiss proverb trenchantly puts it, behind every rich man stands a devil, and behind every poor man, too. Since optimism seems to have bit Since optimism seems to have been meant, and hence an optimistic attitude toward something unpleasant, I would add, excuse me, I would add, I would add that in my view, it would be equally instructive to speak of a pessimism of austerity. Human temperaments being extremely varied, indeed contradictory, we should never forget that what is good for one man is harmful for another. One man, because of his inner weakness, needs encouragement. Another, because of his inner assurance, needs the restraint of austerity. Austerity enforces simplicity, which is true happiness. But to live simply, without regret and bitterness, is a more is a moral task which many people will find very hard. Next question. Will turning away from material things foster the team spirit? A common need naturally strengthens the team spirit, as we can see in England at this moment, but the very existence of many moral weaklings increases the danger of selfishness. All extraordinary conditions bring men's badness as well as their goodness to light. However, since the majority of our people may be regarded as morally healthy, there is ground for hope that a common need will cause their virtues to shine more brightly. Believing as I do in the virtues and diligence of the Swiss, I am convinced that they have an absolute will to preserve their national independence and are ready to make the heaviest sacrifices. At any rate, the team spirit in Switzerland is not undeveloped and hardly needs special strengthening. So I'm reading from a piece that Dr. Young wrote in May of 1941 in answer to a series of questions. I'm on page five of seven. Above all, we do not have those social con I'm above all, we do not have those social contrasts between a solid upper crust and a party on the one hand and an anonymous mass on the other, which in other countries keep citizens apart. Class conflicts with us are mainly imported from abroad. Instead of pushing the team spirit artificially to the fore, it seems to me more important to stress the development of the personality, since this is the real vehicle of the team. Faced with the question of what a man does, one should never forget who is doing it. If a community consists of nothing but trash, then it amounts to nothing. For a hundred imbeciles, still do not add up to anything sensible. This <laughs> right. The noise <laughs> Oh my goodness. The noisy 
The noisy and insistent preaching of the team spirit only causes them to forget their contribution to society consists of nothing but their own uselessness. If I belong to an organization with 100,000 members, it does not prove in the least that I am any good, let alone if there are millions of them, let alone if there are millions of them. And if I pat myself on the back for being a member, I am merely adding to my non-value the illusion of excessive value. Since in accordance with the laws of mass psychology, even the best man loses his value and meaning in the mass, it is doubly important for him to be insecure. It is doubly important for him to be in secure possession of his good qualities in order not to damage the community of which he is a member. Instead of talking so much about the team spirit, it would be more to the point to appeal to the spirit, to appeal to the spiritual maturity and responsibility of the individual. If a man is capable of leading a responsible life himself, then he is also conscious of his duties to the community. We Swiss believe in quality. Let us therefore use our national belief for improving the value of the individual instead of letting him become a mere drop in the ocean of the community. Self-knowledge and self-criticism are perhaps more necessary for us in Switzerland and more important for the future than a great herd of social than a great herd of social irresponsibles in switzerland we could do nothing anyway with mass in switzerland we could do nothing anyway with masses welded with masses welded together and controlled by iron discipline our country is far too small what counts with us are the virtues the stout heartedness and toughness of the individual who is conscious of himself. In the case of extreme necessity, everyone has to do his bit in his allotted place. It is nice to hope for a helper in it is nice to hope for a helper in time of need, but self reliance is better. The community is not anything good in itself as it gives countless weaklings a wonderful opportunity to hide behind each other and palm off their own incompetence on their fellows. People are only too willing to expect the community to do what they themselves are incapable of doing, and they hold it responsible when they as individuals fail to fulfill their necessary obligations. Sound familiar to anybody? Okay, let's see. So, although we Swiss undoubtedly have a fairly well-developed team spirit, most of our attempts at community are miserable specimens. They grow on stony ground and are divided by thorny hedges. One and all suffer from the Swiss national vices of obstinacy and mistrustfulness. At least, these national qualities are called vices when people get annoyed about them, as very often happens. But from another point of view, they could almost be extolled as virtues. It is quite impossible to say how much of our political, intellectual, and moral independence of the powerful and moral independence of the powerful world around us we owe to these unpleasant qualities. Fortunately, I am almost inclined to say their roots penetrate into the deepest recesses of every Swiss heart. We are, we are not easily fooled. How many poisonous infections, how many fantastic ideas may we not have avoided in the course of the centuries thanks to these qualities. The fact that we are in some respects a hundred years behind the times and that many reforms are desperately overdue is the price we have to pay 
for such useful national failings. Hence, I expect more from the Swiss national character than from an artificially fostered team spirit, because it, because it has deeper roots in our native soil than an enthusiasm which wanes with the words that conjure it up. It is all very fine to be swept along on a tide of enthusiasm, but one cannot enthuse indefinitely. Enthusiasm is an exceptional state, and human reality is made up of a thousand vulgarities. Just, just what these are is the decisive thing. It is ordin If the ordinary Swiss makes very sure that he himself has it good and can summon up no enthusiasm whatever for the joys of having nothing in glorious solidarity with everybody else, that is certainly unromantic. Worse, it is selfish, but it is sound instinct. The healthy man does not torture others. Generally, it is the tortured who turn into torturers. And the healthy man also has a certain amount of goodness which he is the more inclined to expend since he does not enjoy a particularly good conscience on since he does not since he does not enjoy a particularly good conscience on account of his obvious selfishness we all have a great need to be good ourselves and occasionally we like to show it by the appropriate actions if good can come of evil self-interest then the two sides of human nature have cooperated. But when, it, but, when in a, but when in a fit of enthusiasm, we begin with the good, our deep-rooted selfishness remains in the background, unsatisfied and resentful, only waiting for an opportunity to take its revenge in the most atrocious way. community at all costs, I fear, produces the flock of sheep that infallibly attracts the wolves. Man's moral endowment is of so dubious man's moral endowment is of so dubious a nature that a stable condition seems possible only when every sheep is a bit of a wolf and every wolf a bit of a sheep. The truth is that a society is more secure the more th the more the much maligned instincts can of their own accord start off the counter start off the counterplay of good and evil pure good and pure evil are both superhuman excesses although there is naturally no need to preach self-interest since it is omnipresent it should not be needlessly slandered, for when the individual does not prosper, neither does the whole. And when he is driven to a natural altruism, self-interest reappears in monstrous, inhuman form, changing shape from hour to hour to employ my savage power, or I employ my savage power, for the instincts cannot be finally suppressed or eradicated. Excessive sacrifice of the individual for the sake of the community makes no sense in our case anyway, since our country being so small, we are in no position to assert our self-interest in nationalistic form, that is, by the conquest of foreign countries. In sober skepticism, as opposed to propaganda talk, in such instinct and closeness to nature, in self-limitation grounded in self-knowledge, I see more health for our fatherland than in fervent speeches about regeneration and hysterical attempts at and in historic and in hysterical attempts at reorientation. Sooner or later, it will be found that nothing really new happens in history. There could be talk of something really novel only if the unimaginable happened, if reason, humanity, and love won a lasting victory. 
So I have been reading from um, Return to the Simple Life, which was uh, Dr. Jung's answers to a, seri a series of questions which were sent to him in a ser were sent to him in a survey um, in May 1941. So he was uh, giving this response at a time that World War II had started in Belgium and France and uh, Germany, of course, and Britain, of course. Battle of Britain was in June of 1940, so this was nearly a year later. And um, But before the United States entered World War II, which happened about six months later. So Thomas says, makes me want to visit Switzerland. <laughs> me too. <laughs> I have been there. Um, I there, we, there was one day in my life when I visited four countries on the same day. I started in Lausanne, Switzerland, drove down through the St. Bernard Pass to um, northern Italy, around to Mont Blanc, up through Mont Blanc Tunnel, into France and back into Switzerland to Geneva Airport, and then I flew to Ireland all in one day. It was quite a day. Anyway, <laughs> uh, it was fun though. Uh, it was just uh, two businessmen, me and one colleague, and we had a nice talk and drove for about 12 hours, and then I flew off to Ireland. Uh, so, anyway. Uh, I don't have anything more for today, and um, what to say? I don't have. I I don't think I have anything to say about our current events at the moment. Um, I, as with Dr. Jung, uh, I think that we've gone beyond the pale here, and. Um, so people are going to have to learn. Um, you know, what I, what I see in some political debate, for example, um, the, the debate over abortion, uh, for those of us who are of an age uh, before the Roe v. Wade decision was made, we know how horrific the situation was before Roe v. Wade. In other words, many young women were dying by improper abortions. Uh, lots of terrible things were happening in our society. And approximately 15% of the medical community was committing felonies in the form of abortion. And um, Obviously, lots of babies died in that time as well. And since Roe v. Wade, at least we've stopped this carnage and stopped the brutalization of our society in that respect. The unfortunate fact about that is, though, that my daughters and most young women who are under 45 don't remember those days, those terrible old days. And so many of them um, think that if we forbid abortion, that that's some go somehow going to save a baby, which it is not. Uh, it will just be a brutalization of our society. But it seems that what maybe has to happen in every generation is that society will be brutalized by that once again, and we never learn. As Dr. Jung indicated, everything in history just happens over and over again. And so that's a perfect example of what he's talking about. Um, you know, in my view, forbidding abortion will save no babies, uh, but it will brutalize our society again. And then the young women who are under 45 will learn just how bad that is. And when enough of them see how bad that is, then abortion will be permitted again. And meanwhile, of course, women who 
want an abortion now can pretty much get them anywhere in the world except in certain states in the United States. So no, no babies will be saved. Um, and Student of Rhythm says it's tragic how people keep charging into the same uninformed actions precisely. And um, so uh, we shall see what we shall see in the coming months coming month, let's say. <laughs> uh, in five weeks, we'll know what's happening in the United States. Grenad says, I thought they just wanted to curtail state funding of abortion, not make it illegal. Correct me if I'm wrong. I believe you're wrong. Uh, they definitely wanted to make abortion illegal. And um, but forbidding isn't going to prevent it. It's only going to forbid. And of course, young women who don't have the means to go to a place where they can get a legal abortion will do it illegally, as they always have. And so uh, it was pretty awful before Roe v. Wade. Um, all you have to do is look at a couple of old movies. Dirty Dancing is one, and another one is In the Heat of the Night. Uh, and if you see either one of those movies in their uncut version, uh, you will see what I'm talking about at least a little bit. Uh, you won't actually see how truly horrific it is. And so, anyway... Um, so anyway, I'm going to discontinue this for today and we'll see what happens as we go forward. Maybe I'll do another reading tomorrow. I'm trying to parse these out. I think that it's important to get these ideas out. If you haven't done it, I urge you to take a look at the uh, two videos that I did. I've now edited them. If you haven't looked at them, please look at them. They are uh, the first two videos which appear on the Carl Jung, or I'm sorry, on uh, Jung's Red Book for Our Time, Searching for Soul Under Postmodern Conditions. I've now put that um, playlist right up at the top of the homepage for this channel. And so I hope you'll look at the first two videos, which are parts one and two of the essay of Dr. Thomas Arst. Um, this is volume one. Okay, this is volume one. And it's, uh, I think that Dr. Arst's essay is truly profound. I've read it many times. I've read it here. And, um, I hope that you'll listen to it and maybe listen to it more than once. It has a lot of information. And Thomas, thank you very much for the birthday wish. Yes, that is tomorrow. Um, and uh, Thomas says, Faulkner's Wild Palms also. Is, is that a book or a movie? Uh, I presume that means it's a book if it's Faulkner's, unless it was made into a movie, because I think some of his books were made into movies. Um, but if it's a book, it's probably pretty gruesome, I suppose. Um, anyway, if it's on that topic, uh, because authors tend to make things a little bit more gruesome in their novels than they do in their movies. <laughs> anyway, okay, so thank you very much, um, and, uh, we will march on to a better time, we hope.